This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As Hurricane Sally batters the Gulf Coast and climate-fueled wildfires continue to ravage the West, we turn to look at how a well-known climate change denier has been tapped for a top position at NOAA. That's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. University of Delaware professor David Legates has written papers calling for more fossil fuel emissions, has had his work supported by the Robert Mercer-funded Heartland Institute and Coke Industries, as well as major gas companies. In 2011, he was pushed out of his role as Delaware's state climatologist for his views on climate change, which go against the scientific consensus. In 2018, the same year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warned humanity had only a dozen years to mitigate climate change or face global catastrophe. David Legates spoke at a Heartland Institute conference on a panel called, quote, Why CO2 Emissions Are Not Creating a Climate Crisis. We've all heard that carbon dioxide, of course, is a pollutant. It drives climate. It is the single most important factor that determines what the climate's going to be uh, in the future and what the temperature is going to be and how much precipitation there's going to be, so much so that we have to put a danger sign on carbon dioxide. Um, but the question I really want to ask is, is it really a benefit? Not just simply um, has it gotten a bad rap, but is it really something that we could do with a little bit more? So the answer to my question, is carbon dioxide a pollutant or a benefit? It clearly isn't a pollutant. It is definitely a benefit, and we can do with a little bit more of it. David Legates will serve as NOAA's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Observation and Prediction. Top climate scientist Michael Mann told NPR he could not imagine, quote, a more misguided decision than the appointment. Well, for more, we're going to New Jersey, where we're joined by climate scientist who spent his career at NOAA, David Goodrich. He is the former director of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climate Observations Division. Since his retirement, he spent his time chronicling the effects of the climate crisis from his bicycle. He's the author of A Hole in the Wind, A Climate Scientist's Bicycle Journey Across the U.S., and most recently just published A Voyage Across an Ancient Ocean, in which he takes a bike journey from the Alberta tar sands in Canada to the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Dr. David Goodrich. It's great to have you with us. We want to talk about your book in a minute and your journey, but start with David Legates, what it means to have a top fossil fuel company uh, funded scientist, uh, as the head, one of the top people at NOAA, where you used to work? Well, first of all, th uh, thanks very much for having me on, uh, Amy. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think the appointment of Dr. Legates, you're basically, if you look at the science community, you have about 97 percent of the scientists um, disagreeing with the position of Dr. Legates that Carbon dioxide is a is a big problem and a big issue in um, in climate. So it's um, is disappointing to be sure. Uh, I know that the American Geophysical Union, which is sort of the the one of the the biggest uh, scientific organizations for uh, uh, for geology and geophysics and oceanography in the U.S., has called for uh, this appointment to be pulled back. So. Um, it's an issue. Um, I, I'd also point out that it's certainly not the first time. I mean, once when I, uh, when I was working with NOAA back in 2002, there was uh, White House interference where uh, government reports documenting climate change uh, had, um, were re-edited to say there's significant uncertainties in all of this. And it's actually been um, better than 30 years since James Hansen um, testified before Congress that we have detected a human signal in climate change. Um, it's kind of time for the, the fog machine to stop, if you will. I'm wondering if you can talk about the whole issue of climate catastrophe right now. We've got the hurricanes um, uh, that are battering the Gulf Coast, and we've got this massive, unprecedented fires along the West Coast. And talk about how your latest book and your latest bicycle journey, um, as you followed what you call the ancient ocean, uh, illustrates what's going on. Well, what I tried to do on this bicycle trip, the first time after I retired, I rode across the country from Oregon to 
uh, from uh, Delaware to Oregon, and looking at climate change along the way. And I thought, maybe I could go ride to a place where climate change is coming from, where the carbon is coming from the ground. So I, I figured I would start in the tar sands of northern Alberta, which is one of the, the most carbon intensive uh, mining operations on the planet, and ride across the Alberta, Saskatchewan, North Dakota prairie to the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota. So I could see it sort of from two different sides of the border. And um, before I started from the town of Fort McMurray in, in Alberta, which is where the, uh, the tar sands mining is centered, uh, I chartered a plane. And you can really only see the extent of this from the air. It is, um, you're seeing, you know, from, say, 5,000 feet, which is where the plane was flying, you can see these uh, what look like small pickup trucks, but they're actually the biggest, uh, the biggest dump trucks on the planet, um, going to and from the face of the uh, of the tar sand mines, and then basically to take uh, this this oil is essentially boiled down with chemicals to where it can flow through pipelines. Um, that takes an enormous amount of energy. Think about how much it takes to melt tar at. 40, in a 40 below Alberta winter. Um, so it takes a huge amount of energy just to get this, um, this oil out of the ground. Um, and then I rode through the, uh, the northern boreal forest and across the plains to the Bakken fields of North Dakota. And that's a different landscape. I mean, I was riding in on a really hot day. It was pushing 95 degrees and on the horizon, you're seeing um, oil flares, fires. It, it reminds you of, of mortar out of Lord of the Rings. And uh, there is a tremendous amount of, uh, of fire going, uh, of uh, uh, flaring going on in the Bakken. Um, so it's sort of two, two different sides of the, the same coin. In North Dakota, that's hydraulic fracturing or fracking going on rather than uh, basically digging it out of the ground, as you, as you see in Alberta. You write in your book, roughly 80 percent of currently known stocks of fossil fuels need to stay in the ground to keep climate change within somewhat manageable limits. Yet, fossil fuel industries are still being incentivized um, to keep producing oil and have received massive bailouts during COVID, even as the oil industry is failing and prices are falling. Can you talk about this? Sure. I mean, um, we've known for quite a while that uh, burning fossil fuels is a major way that climate change uh, is, is going on. And the idea that um, a large amount of the, the fossil uh, the fossil fuel resistance, or, excuse me, that the uh, uh, the fossil fuel extraction is being supported by the government is is uh, amazing to me. Um, what needs to happen is going to more renewable energy. Um, in fact, policies have gone against support for uh, for wind and solar. Um, over the last couple of years. So uh, it's something that is, is disappointing, but um, I, I liken the changing climate to sort of turning a ship, that it's, there's a lot of momentum. Um, nobody's going to turn off fossil fuels uh, tomorrow, but we need to start getting serious about it um, and stop supporting the uh, stop subsidizing the production of fossil fuels both both here and around the world you know, we spent time in North Dakota covering the indigenous struggles to protect the planet. Um, and I was wondering if you can talk about how significant they were, you know, people, for example, um, leading the charge to oppose the Dakota Access Pipeline, which, of course, uh, ultimately was built, uh, along with the Keystone XL that President Trump green-lighted in both cases. Well, um, the— I think the protests actually have um, have been very significant. I mean, Dakota Access was built. Um, 
there is still legal action going on against the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline, and Keystone um, has yet to be built. There is still legal action going on there. And I think what's happened is that the protests um, that came about from Standing Rock and from the environmental community at large have made building pipelines and moving fossil fuels around a far more difficult and expensive proposition. And I, I believe that's a good thing. You're basically trying to um, reduce the flow of carbon into the atmosphere. And pipelines are the way that that happens. So there's, um, there is still a lot of push to build pipeline capacity out of the tar sands in Alberta. And um, that is actually limiting how much, uh, uh, how much activity is going on in the tar sands and in the Bakken as well. And David also, Goodrich, we just have 30 seconds, but the link to what we're seeing on the West Coast, the unprecedented fires. Sure. Um, the warming has resulted in a, the drying out of the forests, basically setting them up to burn. Um, there has been certainly issues with long-term forest management, but even in very well-managed forests, um, they have burned. And it's because it's gotten warmer, it's gotten drier, and it takes um, almost nothing to get the, uh, get the fires burning. Well, David Goodrich, want to thank you for being with us, climate scientist, former director of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that's NOAA's Climate Observations Division. His new book, A Voyage Across an Ancient Ocean, A Bicycle Journey Through the Northern Dominion of Oil.